So before we start, um, I want to give you guys a defensive test here in a minute. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some pictures very quickly. I want you to look at the pictures. At the end of my talk, we'll have a little test about this. So you guys ready? All right, here we go. Okay? We'll come back at the end of the talk and you'll see where I'm going with this. All right, so what I'm going to talk to you about here is uh, zero trust networks. And it's one of these things that it's a new buzzword now for us at, at Virginia Tech. Um, it's not a big deal. I, um, every university, whether they'd like to admit it or not, has been operating in a zero trust uh, environment for, for, since their beginning. Uh, we connected to the internet in 1979, 1980. Um, and BYOD, uh, which is a, a lot of bane of existence for a lot of my counterparts in the commercial world, we've been doing it since 1984, so it's not that big a deal for us. Oh, well, and Johnny Hamm and I, we had that little laugh when he did his talk. We've been running a full production IPv6 network uh, since 2005. So you come and hook into our network, and you get a v6 address and a v4 address. Um, we have two stroke 32s and a 48. Uh, for our V6 subnets. Um, if that, let me put it in perspective. The entire uh, 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 IPv4 address space has 10 to the 12 addresses. One of our subnets has 10 to the 19 addresses. So um, it, it provides an interesting thing from a defensive standpoint. It uh, gives us a lot of flexibility uh, to, to thwart hackers and force them into certain types of scanning patterns. This is just a little biography stuff on me. Um, I have a short attention span. I don't like to focus the rest of my life on computer stuff. But what I find is that everything I do all links back uh, to that. Um, I've, I am one of the original SANS instructors. Um, and I'm a charter member of the Center for Internet Security. How many of you use the Center for Internet Security benchmarks on Linux or Windows or all that? I was a co-author of those documents, the original ones. So uh, a lot of my fingerprints are in a lot of the stuff that you do. And I don't know why I just told you that, because now you know who to blame. Um, anyway, uh, uh, the other thing I like to do is I like to write, uh, play music and stuff like that. I was just talking to Don. Our band retired uh, in 2017 after 38 years. Uh, we did our last festival in uh, Albuquerque. But uh, if any of you ever did hear uh, or listen to the PRI program, World Cafe, for the first seven years, that was me. Uh, uh, that was the theme song that our band did. So one of the projects that I worked on in SANS in 2001 was the top 10 security mistakes made by individuals. So please, take a look at this list. And have we fixed a single one of them? <laughs> now, I, I put a check behind uh, not installing antivirus software, because I count Windows Defender as uh, antivirus software now. And it, at least it's there. Of course, that's just part of, the, part of the issue, because having it installed and running it are two different things, OK? But have we fixed any one of these? So my question to you as a security professional in the security industry is, what have we been doing the last 18 years? OK? I wrote a blog a couple years back, and some people thought I was nuts. But I said, we have created a cybersecurity industrial complex. Dwight Eisenhower is one of my favorite things. You're going to hear a lot of historical references because history repeats itself, especially in what we're doing. And so I think we've created uh, 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 this complex that we, you know, it's not in our best interest. And someone said, well, we, we're going to get rid of it, you know, all these problems. I said, no, we're not. We've created a multi-billion dollar industry. We're in it. I'm in it. That's designed to deal with threats. We eliminate the root causes. We're not going to fix anything, right? Now, isn't that nice to, to think about, right? So, um, and then you say, oh, you, you guys at educational institutions, you know, you're, you don't understand the real world. Well, our budget's a $1.4 billion budget. We have $550 million in research stuff. We're a multinational 
uh, uh, organization. We have campuses in Northern Virginia, in the southern part of Virginia where the main campus is, we have a campus in Switzerland. And that, to me, gives me the same thing as, as what we would see in a traditional corporate environment. My question to you, though, as defenders is, what are you defending? What's your primary mission? Anybody? So protecting data, sensitive data. So if that's our key mission, right? Do you know how sensitive data moves around your organization? Do you know what the business processes are in your organization? So at our university, and this is pretty much at any university, we have the administrative part of the university. This is the payroll part, purchasing, the stuff that we all see, you know, all of that type of stuff. That's the security model that's kind of closest to what we would call the traditional corporate model. Right? The academic side of the house, because we're a university, we have instructional stuff. That's the process that supports learning and teaching and all of that type of stuff. All of our students are BYOD. Since 1984, they've been required to purchase their own computer. The kids that live on campus probably bring four or five devices on there, which has really exploded our network uh, in there. We, it's probably a 150,000 node network for 36,000 students or so. Okay, but faculty, staff, they all bring their stuff in. That security model is that of an ISP. And that, I, my, my friends, you're moving into that world. You will be in an ISP security model in the next five years, like it or not. All right? And so that's, that's what we have there. The other piece, then, is the research wing, because we're a research university. Those of you in the manufacturing sector or in engineering firms, you have a research wing. You have a wing of your company that is designed to create new products. So in that case, you're exactly like that. We are exactly like any traditional corporate structure. You have all of these business processes, so do we. You fight for customers, so do we. We call them students, but you, you know. You market a product, we market information. You have elaborate brochures, posters, uh, PR wings, we have football teams. So it's that type of stuff that, that we have. We are just like you guys when in terms of a corporate structure. So what is it that a hackers do? Well, and like I said, I've been doing cybersecurity since 1991, and this is where I'll go back and say history repeats itself. In all of the attacks, and people said, hey, Rand, how'd you become a security expert? Well, it's because I got the crap hacked out of me, <laughs> okay? And I knew, we learned how to recover. There were times I can remember I got hit really hard. We, you know, we, 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 it took us a couple of months to do this, and then a couple of months later, somebody in an engineering department gets hit, and I recognize the attack. It's the same attack that hit me. So I walk up to them and I go, hey, you know, what you need to do is you need to look in these directories. You're going to find these files. You need to get rid of those files and put these files back and restore them from backup. Then you've got to go over here and look at this thing, blah, blah, blah. Because it all happened to me. And as I walk away, those guys are going, oh, my God, that guy walks on water. <laughs> what a genius he is. And I'm going, well, I'm glad that I'm not the only one that was dumb enough to fall for that attack, okay? <laughs> But in the past 30 years, looking at all the attacks we've seen, it comes down to these three things. They're either after our data, sensitive data, as you mentioned, okay? And they either want to destroy it or they want to disclose it. Or they want to use the machines that they pop inside your network to attack other sites, the attribution problem. Anyone else think of anything else that they've done? It comes right down to that. Well, if these are the three main goals of what attackers do, those of you that are pen testers, and I've done my share of pen testing too, those are my goals. Maybe not destroy the data, but at least get to it. So if those are the goals, then we should defend accordingly. We shouldn't be off on a tangent chasing the latest uh, rabbit all over the place when these are the three things that come through. So what have we done before, okay? Well, you know, we protect systems. Well, that's nice, except that's not where the real issue is. Okay. As a CISO, I have to look at stuff from an, from an enterprise level. If this machine gets compromised and there's no sensitive data on it, it's a compromise. If there's sensitive data on it, then I have to worry. Okay. And so let me ask you this. How many of you would let me at Virginia Tech ping a machine inside your network? Oh, I'm in the defensive group, right? 
How many of you would let an, a user inside your network ping me at Virginia Tech? You lie. <laughs> you lie because my logs show otherwise. <laughs> my point is that we've, we've been looking at it backwards. We're so focused on trying to keep the bad guys from coming in that we don't look at what leaves our network. And that's, again, the key part of being the CISO and the data breach stuff. It ain't, it's a compromise if it stays inside my network. It's a breach if it leaves my network. Okay? And so looking at outbound data. So systems, yeah, that's okay, but that's not what the problem is, all right? Well, the network. Well, we have assumed since we did this, and this is the, one of the key precepts of zero trust, is that the network is hostile. Okay? You can't protect the network. I don't care if you think you can. You can't. You know, Johnny Ham's talk uh, earlier, I always like listening to him because it, it just sort of reinforces it. The network is, is hostile. And if you thought that, it's, that you can control everything there, well, you know, we have these little things. Oh, what do we call them? Smartphones, right? They don't need to use your network. So you can't control this network from inside your own organization. So that brings us to what? This is what it is. And let me repeat what it is. This is what we should be defending, sensitive data. So my next question to you is, do you know where your sensitive data is stored? Anybody use a, a product, of, well, they used to be called Identity Finder? Show of hands, anybody? If you're not using Identity Finder or something very similar to it, you have no idea where your sensitive data is. Got to find it before you can protect it, okay? So, I always like this little thing here, and this is great. I was taking all sorts of notes for the previous talks. You know, we have the kill chain thing. As a pen tester or an offensive guy, I have to complete every single one of these steps successfully. As a defender, I only have to block one. Hopefully more to the left side than to the right side. But even if I, even if I get to the execute part and the maintain part, if I can interrupt that chain, then the score's tied. You break into our, a machine into our network at Virginia Tech, score hacker one, Randy zero. But if I prevent the outbound, right, because usually they've got to talk to somebody, want, let somebody know that, hey, I'm in. If I can interrupt that conversation, it's Randy one, hacker one, tie goes to the defender. So looking at outbound traffic is really, really key in this mess, all right? So another one of these, you know, a pyramid of pain things, and I'm leading up to the zero trust thing because this is what we need to do. One of the courses that I teach at SANS is the 20 critical controls course. And so when you're building your defensive architecture, you need to make sure that you can follow this tree. You need to start at the bottom. Can you name the assets you're defending? Do you know how to get to those things? How many of you think that you know where every piece of equipment on your network is? Okay, you all have, now how many of you would say, oh, well, when you connect to our network, you have to use our NAC. And that would give me, so let me ask you this. If you get an email from me and it says, this IP address that's inside your network, how long would it take you to find that asset? Let me say an hour. Anybody think they can find it within an hour? Well, you are shy. A day? <laughs> what if you get, so it's not, I'm not going to be sending you a note about an attack that happened in real time. I might be sending you a note that happened two weeks ago. So can you tell me where that asset is or was two weeks ago? Do you know, uh, so, okay, how many of you are using a NAC or, uh, you know, clean access or uh, clear path, something like that to register your devices to, to your network? And those of you say, well, we use those addresses. Well, how is that address generated? For static, how, what's the process for a static IP address? For uh, a dynamic addresses, are you using DHCP? If you're using DHCP, what's your lease time? Okay. If, if, are you using NAT? A lot of you like to use NAT. A lot of you, can you do translations that if you're on a wireless network like this and you access a website, what shows up in the log is not the address of the machine, because you guys have done a good job proxying it. What shows up is the address of the wireless access point that's closest. So can you make that map to get to that machine in the wireless thing? Does your networking group use PAT, port address translation, in, under load? In which case, that really skews where your assets are there. 
And we're just on inventory. Okay? Telemetry. Do you have visibility? Can you find those machines? It's really kind of funny because we do vulnerability scans of our critical resources on our network. And every now and then, a departmental IT guy will firewall off our vulnerability scanners because <laughs> they don't want us to scan them. Okay? Except that we can generate addresses inside their address blocks and scan from inside their network. So anyway, do you have that telemetry? Can you see what's there? Can you detect unauthorized activity? Johnny Ham's example there, you know, when we're looking around, he was showing a, an outbound uh, types of proxy connections. Do we have that capability? Do you have that capability now to do that? And once you, ha if you do have that capability, can you classify it in terms of, is it this a nuisance attack or is it a data breach style attack? What is it? Is it a DDoS attack? Uh, one of the groups, uh, projects I worked on with SANS was uh, around in, uh, uh, Y2K, when everybody was all concerned about DDoS attacks, and then we, we helped uh, um, do some investigations about the Mafia Boy attack back then. Well, can you classify it? And then, if you can classify it, do you know who your, who your uh, attackers are? Uh, universities suffered a really interesting breach uh, or attack a couple of months ago. I would get credentials to your uh, uh, a personal account at a university. Then, Instead, what they did was they logged into that university's library system. Ooh, that's an attack, right? Everything so far normal, normal uh, user ID logs into the university library and moves over to the academic journals and starts downloading every single academic journal they can get their hand on. Now, except for volume, there's nothing hackerish about that, nothing that looks odd about that, except that this was a nation state attack and they were trying to get access to information that they could not get access to because of international sanctions. Yet that's a, it, nothing would have triggered on a, a, a standard IDS, okay? So we have that, we have the behaviors, can you detect the activity, can you fee, find uh, 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 people that are, are already in your net and then, can you uh, observe their activity in real time, right? And then finally, can you do something to get them out of it? Um, I've always said, and people always, you know, tease me about, you know, you're, you're Mr. Hate Firewalls. Uh, I said, yeah, I, I, I don't like them as uh, 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 protection devices. Now, part of this, uh, one of the guy, early guys in SANS was Marcus Raynham. Anybody know who he is? Yeah, well, Marcus actually worked in SANS at the time, and he, he was one of the uh, fathers of firewalls, although his version of a firewall was an application firewall, closer to what um, uh, Black Ice and uh, Zone Alarm used to be, way, way, way back then, okay? Um, but, you know, firewalls, to me, are effective protection devices. No, they are effective detection devices. They log packets going in and out but they gotta let something through. And the thing that, that, that turned my, uh, my attitude against them as protection devices were the tunnel tools. HTTP tunnel, SMTP tunnel, ICMP tunnel. Those things right there proved to me that I could punch anything through a border firewall if I decided to go through the wire. Later on when I was doing pen tests, my favorite way to get into a network was over, the, over wireless. And you go, oh, well, we have clean access and all that. Yeah, but you know what? I have Bluetooth and I have Zigbee and I got all the other wireless protocols that will give me a foothold into your network. And from there, all I need to do is open up a connection outbound because you guys don't monitor outbound traffic. And once, I, once you establish that outbound connection, then I can just download my payload straight through. Okay? So the nets change. Five years from now, no, this is now. In the old days when I first started, my hair was darker and, and probably, well, I still had a ponytail back then, but anyway, um, I, you know, I grew up on an IBM mainframe, 371, uh, 155, then a 158. I was a communication systems programmer for an IBM 3705, and there, terminals were hardwired into the, into the mainframe. Static terminal, static device. You wanted to use a computer, you had to go to a room where the terminal was, okay? Then, in the 90s, when uh, PCs uh, really started taking off, we had PCs that were, well, they were mobile. I mean, they're kind of clunky, but you could move them around. 
and you could connect into the network anyway, but the servers stayed in the same place. Maybe they weren't 370 mainframes, but they were VAX systems, or they were RS-2000s, uh, or Solaris systems. And so we had that static server mobile thing. Well, now what's happened is, you know, uh, we have uh, people that are mobile, it's laptops, smartphones, tablets, all that type of stuff, and now the servers have become mobile. Your servers are now containers. Your servers are now serverless uh, uh, applications. And they don't live necessarily inside your borders anymore. There's purchasing applications that are cloud-based. Our, cloud, our class management system is a company called Canvas. They're not inside Virginia Tech. They're outside of Virginia Tech. Every single one of you is using a cloud service for a business function that used to remain, used to be resident inside your networks. So you're exploded. Where's your border? And that's one of the things. It goes back to not being able to trust the network because you have no idea. How many of you are using Amazon S3 clouds? Do you know where your packets go when they leave your border to the Amazon S cloud? I have no idea. We could trace route it. We get different answers the whole time. So you must treat the network as hostile. We need to adapt to that. So another view, this came from uh, Government Computing Magazine or uh, Networks or something like that, GCN. And I thought this was really, really an interesting thing because you have to have security policy now that follows the user no matter where they are or what device they're using. All of us here, we're sitting here, you know, we said, no, we don't want to allow smartphones, tablets to get in. But I guarantee you, your board of directors, your CEOs, your upper management say, I want to be able to use my tablet. I want to be able to use my Surface Pro from wherever I am. So we're in that thing, like it or not, which means data is the new border. Okay? And so how many of you have seen this? <laughs> right? When you log into a service now, and now it's almost to the point where, no, we don't want to use your internal credentials. We want to know, we don't want to use your Google credentials or Facebook or whatever, Azure credentials. And we're moving into that world. Now we're even identification or identity management may or may not be inside our borders, okay? So, I mentioned, do you know where your traffic goes? This is a, a profile, actually this one was from uh, uh, August of 2017. The blue is, uh, so this is number of connections. The blue is what comes into our network uh, by country. You know, the US one's down at the bottom, just I didn't have it there because it would skew that, that graph. But for us, I was surprised the first time we did this. Now, we've been looking at this type of data for five or six years now. I was truly surprised. I thought a lot of our stuff left and not that much came in. But it turns the opposite. Blue is what comes into our network, and red is what leaves our network. And so we did a little bit of analysis. So for instance, right away, oh, China, they're the evil problem. You know, no, we did some analysis on that. And this is part of the defensive structure that we're talking about that you need for zero trust. You need to know what your traffic is doing. So, for instance, in China, you see a lot of stuff coming in. You don't see a lot of stuff going out. The majority of that traffic, not all of it, okay? So let's look at this demographically. We're in universities, so we have lots of students, international students. The Chinese Student Association is the largest subgroup of our international student community. So you expect a lot of that. And then if you look at this traffic, not all of it is part of, uh, you know, not uh, uh, a good majority of it is web-based. And a good majority of that web-based traffic is to Chinese language search engines like Baidu, which makes sense. Chinese speaker, Chinese language website. What's the typical pattern of a, of a, a query, client-server query structure? You have a little bit of outbound, which is your query. You get a lot of data back as a result of the query. You type in Randy Marchani, that's about a 300 byte you know, packet that goes out, you get 16,000 or 17,000 hits. That's a lot of data that comes back. And so you see that type of thing there. When you look at this, more coming in, then we started noticing ratios. What's an acceptable ratio, inbound to outbound? For us, it looks like it's anything that's 2 to 1 up to 20 to 1 inbound versus outbound is what we would categorize as normal traffic. Okay? Then you might see something like this. What do you see? The opposite, right? And, and, and you'll notice a couple of things. Well, this was an exfil back in 14. But you notice if you look at the other countries, well, uh, Brazil and Great Britain, more leaving than coming in. 
But the interesting thing here is that you see France, Russia, Netherlands, Germany, Canada, all these other guys, it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. And what this exfil did, was doing at the time was, it was connecting to thousands of websites around the world in all these countries and exfilling pieces of whatever that was. They were reassembling it somewhere uh, else. They were trying to make it look like it wasn't one big burst of traffic that would flip a monitor. They were trying to initiate thousands of connections and make it look like normal web traffic. The only problem they did was they did it the day before Thanksgiving. We were on break, right? Look at this one. This is actually from this morning. I just uh, went out and took a screenshot. Again, inbound versus outbound. What do you see? Right, more than 21. The, one, the Russian one, what's a possible explanation for more, that much more inbound than outbound? Anybody? A uh, callback? Other bots calling? Well, just look at outbound, right? Or they're calling back to a, a Virginia Tech machine. That's one. A DDoS, that, that could be another one. How about simple scanning? or crypto mining ports. When we saw this, right, right away, oh wait, that looks like it's bad. Let's take a look at, at um, let's take a look at, 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 at the traffic, and it turns out that they were sin, just sin flag out to the connection. If I got an answer back, I sent a reset, right? Sin, at, sin ac, reset. That's what all of the traffic is. And they were looking for crypto miner ports uh, uh, in our network, again, this is a historical thing. This is from 2002 to 2010. This was before we uh, went to move to Gmail for our, our, our uh, email service. What you see here is the number of inbound emails that had, uh, were infected with the virus. From 2002 to uh, 2010, when we, uh, first, when we switched over. What do you see? What was my big primary defensive strategy in 2006 to 2008, or 2004, sorry, 2004 to 2006? I want to focus on email virus stuff, right? But look at what happened after that. No, it's been minimal. So why are we still trying to defend for something that doesn't, is not that big a deal anymore? And you can only see this by collecting data on, on the long term. Again, a factor of zero trust. So we're getting there to the zero trust piece, okay? It, it's very, very similar to that of a, a museum. Uh, Christian Schreiber, who used to be at the University of Arizona, he's with FireEye now, he did a talk uh, where he basically said, uh, you know, uh, 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 edges are like museums. And I, when he explained it to me, I was like, oh man, why didn't I think of that analogy? So, I, I mean, when think about it, right? You go, it, we have to be free flowing access in and out of our network. So that's a, that's a zero trust issue right there, okay? And we do have additional barriers around our high risk assets, but wait a minute, that means you have to identify what your high risk assets are and where they are, right? So we have that type of stuff. Do we have pervasive monitoring? 511 teaches uh, continuous monitoring. Biggest weapon in your defensive arsenal is to look at your traffic and see what the traffic patterns are. We are creatures of habit. 90% of you tomorrow will be sitting in the same chairs. <laughs> now this is going to say, no, not tomorrow. I'm going to really mess you up. When I, go to, when I go to do talks in classrooms in the middle of the semester, I said, I will bet every one of you a, fav your, a glass of your favorite beverage that that's the chair you sat in either on the first or the second day of class. Okay? We are creatures of habit. So we have that type of stuff. And if there is a problem, there's guards and there's on-demand barriers and there's fire suppression and all that type of stuff for active response. And then we have insurance and those things for tracking devices. One of the best things that I can think of, you know, nowadays when we have a scrape login page, one of the best things I can think of right now, of course, it, you know, it's going to change over a little bit, is to put a web bug on, that, on your login page so that if I steal it from you, and I put it up on my website because I'm going to fish you and have you click to this, this site, the web bug is going to say, hey, this isn't a vt.edu address, alert. And we know that, that somebody's done something like that. Penn State's done this, and within 24 hours, they were, they were picking up 
20 to 30 sites that had scraped their logging page, uh, login page and were going to use it for uh, fishes. So a simple thing like a web bug in there. We always assume in the museum world, they always assume that hostels are inside. Um, the other thing too, this is your world, whether you like it or not. It may not be as, as, as diverse as this, but I tell people, I said, look, I'm not the CISO of a university. I'm the CISO of a small city. You know, we have our own power plant. It's hooked into the power grid, the electrical grid for the East Coast, right? We have, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're a land-grant university, so we have agriculture stuff. We have residential neighborhoods, the dorms. We have dining facilities. We have transportation. We have our own police department. We have all of these things that you see in a city, small, you know, network printers, security, offices. We monitor traffic around campus. We, we, our, our transportation institute is one of the top five in the country. Um, you know, autonomous vehicles, that type of stuff. We have our own student health center, own student counseling center, all of that type of stuff. All the medical stuff we got there. Each and every single one of those functions has an IT thing. How is a, a model like Zero Trust not going to apply in this world? Okay, we can't, we cannot, uh, you know, control all the network activity uh, there. So, first, network's always hostile. Second, you must assume they're inside your network already. There's a liberating feeling to that. There's a liberating feeling to that when, when you just assume they're in your network. You kind of relax because then it's sort of relaxing. It becomes, a, it becomes a, the, the hunt, you know, the thrill of the hunt. Uh, segmentation is not sufficient for uh, uh, you know, deciding trust. That's a big one that, that's hard to, to wrap yourselves around. But segmenting a network, yeah, I mean, things have to get through it. It's, my, it's the problem I have with border firewalls. You know, if a truly border, uh, effective border firewall is one that doesn't let anything in and out. So border, you know, border walls don't work. Wait, ooh, that, <laughs> that wasn't a political statement. <laughs> It just came out of my mouth. I said, like, what did I just say? Anyway, uh, but uh, every network device, every network device has to be authenticated. Every, net, every uh, connection on there has to be authenticated and authorized. And your policies have to be dynamic enough to, to, to uh, address these types of things out there. The device, I used to say the device was the border. It's no longer the border. Data is the border. There are no device breach notification laws. There are data breach notification laws. And so finding that data and protecting it, that's what we need to do. Containers and serverless stuff, they're going to mess up forensics. Um, uh, I know the SANS forensics guys are starting to look at how do you do container forensics and how do you do uh, 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 serverless uh, forensics on there. You know, everything is, is, is becoming mobile. You have mobile users, mobile apps. You don't even know where the, the apps are. The apps could be in one place one day and in another place another day, depending on how it goes. Okay? So the theory, yeah, this is a lot easier than done. And I submit to you that you already have components in zero trust. You just aren't thinking of them at, in a zero trust manner. You have logging. You have firewall detection. You have all these things. You have uh, uh, network monitoring tools, host-based monitoring tools. You just have to use them in a different way. The old trust but verify, that's gone. It's, uh, although I always uh, enjoyed the irony. I remember when Ronald Reagan said that. I said, well, it's interesting. He adopts a, a model of the KGB, but verify and never trust. Okay, And you get rid of this trusted inside the perimeter thing, which causes all sorts of problems. And so you, you need to treat all of your hosts as internet addressable. Every single host in our network is addressable by the, over the internet. Makes, you know what, you know what that does? That makes the people who own those machines much more vigilant. Because if it wasn't that way, and those of you that work in, how many of you are working in the security office for your, for your organization? Okay, those of you that work in the security office, you, in, if you're in this one of these things where we have border firewalls and we protect everything, you find that your users get sloppy. They leave doors unlocked, they leave windows unlocked. Why? Because we live in a gated community and the bad guys aren't in. But when everybody knows that we don't live in a farm in Kansas, but we live in downtown Manhattan, 
you lock every single door, you lock every single window when you're not there. And so that change in psychology does a lot, it's a lot better for increasing user awareness of security practices if you treat everything as internet facing there. So some fancy uh, theory control, you know, we talk about the control plane and the data plane, uh, the data plane, uh, applications, firewalls, uh, that type of stuff. We have, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the control plane, this is the type of stuff that generates authentication and authorization. It grants access uh, uh, to it. Um, if we have, uh, how many of you have single, uh, like a single sign-on ID? We have a single sign-on ID. And, and some people say, well, that's bad because if I get those credentials, I get everything you get access to. I said, yeah, that's true. But in incident response, if I want to cut off access, I just cut off that one ID. I don't run around to all these other services to try and cut off access, uh, losing time in my response. So these are, are the two things. You have this already. We just don't call it a control plane or a data plane. You all have an identity uh, management system of some sort. Uh, we have uh, you know, our single user ID. For me, this semester I'm teaching a class. Well, I'm teaching a class this semester, and uh, uh, I have uh, what, we, what I'd call grade modification privileges for my class this semester. I taught a class last semester. I, my my uh, affiliation, my authorization is read only now. I can look at the grades that I gave, but I can't change them. And that changes automatically by our identity management, our ER uh, business systems, depending on where we are in the business uh, life cycle of, of our, our, our annual thing here. Okay? So how, how does this work? Well, you have a client that wants a request to a service. You know, this could be a, 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 a you know, just look at a standard web thing. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm logging in with my Google credentials. Well, I want to get that, so then it reconfigures the service, the target, so that it says, hey, you know, this person passed my test. Uh, go ahead and allow that to happen. And uh, I, I'm going to notify the client that you got temporary access for the length of your session. And then we do this uh, whole thing. We log in. This is stuff you do already. We're just not thinking of it in terms of a zero trust thing. Inventory is one of the hardest things to, to come up with. This is just from a Beyond Core. Uh, uh, Google's uh, version of Beyond Core is close, they, uh, except that they own all the devices. And that's the nice thing, but it's not going to work in our world where we have ISPs and things like that. Okay? So, you know, where do you get it? You get uh, certificate authorities, asset inventories, uh, the stuff that I was talking about earlier. This is, uh, I was kind of saying that because one of the key pieces in Zero Trust is you have to know where your things are, okay? And not necessarily uh, you're going to get this from a single point. Getting network IP addresses is nice. Uh, you know, Active Directory, you got an idea of, of some of the, of some of the uh, 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 software inventory things there, but who's the owner of it? Who's the management group? Who are, these, who are the uh, groups that use this? You need to get this from a lot of, of your, of your uh, other resources in there and then see what happens. But this is a really hard one. Control one in the critical controls, the inventory of hardware devices, uh, authorized and unauthorized. That's a really difficult one to do uh, there. Okay? So we want to put as much of this stuff as close to the endpoints as possible. And the reason is very simple, because the endpoints are the ones that are mobile. Okay? So you need something that can move around um, so to speak, with the, with the, uh, uh, the uh, endpoint itself. And then you have this uh, policy engine which says, okay, based on not only your uh, authentication thing, but where you are in your business cycle, are you allowed to access or modify certain data? The example I talked about with me, this semester I can change uh, grades in the class I'm teaching. I can't do that for past semesters. So, my affiliation is dynamic and it changes. And you know what? It changes without my, uh, 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 really without my knowledge. Okay? Um, this is leading us to, I think, that I'm going, I think it's true, Stanford is doing this, uh, but we're moving back to device certificates. I think uh, PDCs, personal digital certificates, device certificates, with that infrastructure, that's a piece that you need for zero trust. Okay? And then you can move on uh, that way. And some people say, oh, Randy, you know, if they steal your laptop, then uh, I got access to everything you got. 
I said, well, if you steal my laptop and I didn't report it as stolen, then shame on me. But once it's reported as stolen, you just revoke the certificates. Okay? And, and uh, you know, then they, they have a laptop, but they can't do uh, much of anything else. Uh, you know, we have some components, the trust engine, Beyond Core, uh, did this thing where they say, hey, uh, the, these guys here uh, uh, are, you know, uh, maybe you build a trust scale like we do. This is a group that handles uh, Social Security and bank account numbers and all that stuff very, very frequently. It's part of their job. They're like bursars, payroll, a, a purchasing, those guys. Those are the guys that you want to worry about uh, uh, there. They have a certain trust score, and that's a lot different than a trust score of a student in our network or a general user in our network who's just doing the stuff to do uh, work. Okay. Um, MFA. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on there other than to tell you that when we, we moved over to Duo 2FA in 2016, all faculty, staff, student, and alumni. I don't know, we have 100, some 150,000 users using it. It wasn't that big a deal. And what we saw was the number of compromised accounts due to a fish dropped almost to zero. Um, we're seeing now social engineering against 2FA. I'll talk about that later. But, uh, but in terms of, okay, you fell for a fish and you gave up your, your username and password, you did not give up your second factor. Okay. Um, so where do we do it? Well, TLS, IPsec, you know, filtering, uh, you know, you, know, you want to uh, 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 start at the host and handle inbound traffic. Uh, the default, of the, it's deny all on most host-based firewalls uh, on the Windows side and the Mac side. So that takes care of your external traffic. Uh, whatever you install on those machines can modify your host-based firewalls. Um, you do that. But you also want to look at egress filtering, the traditional thing of, to prevent packet spoofing. Again, you assume that the network is, is uh, hostile. And so net flows, you know, you want to authenticate those before processing. Uh, you want to make sure that you have some type of, of uh, encryption. Wireless networks is an easy sell t for encryption. Uh, for our general users. This is a wireless network. You're a wireless computer, I'm a wireless computer, everybody can hear what's, what's going on. You know, if I said, hey, Don, my social security number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you all have heard it. Pero si empiezo a hablar español, los únicos que me entienden son los que no hablan español. Esta es una forma de encripción. So I encrypt the traffic, okay? And that's what, that's what I want to do there in a zero trust network. Uh, strongest authentication uh, algorithms. You know, let me tell you. If a vendor says, we use proprietary, run. Proprietary algorithm, run away. And you want to scan your vulnerable, your critical services. You want to do a vulnerability scan of them as, as uh, frequently as possible. Okay? So start off small, uh, profile your traffic. You have those graphs I showed you at the beginning. You have that data in your network. Your networking group collects that. It's a, just a question of you getting access to that and looking at it over a period of time. This is where SIMs come in handy, because your networking group will collect it, but they're going to run out of disk space. So you, you, you pump this stuff over. We log just about everything that goes around on the network side of the house. Um, I think we're getting like a terabyte a day. We have like uh, 5,000 uh, uh, servers that are feeding our SIM uh, uh, now uh, to, to profile traffic. Okay, And so this log, log, log. Um, you know, uh, some people say, well, you guys have become the mini NSA of, of your networks. Well, yeah, we could uh, if, if it really came down to that. Uh, you know, I said, well, Randy, you, you've surrendered. You used to be a packet hippie. You know, packets can go anywhere. Uh, I said, no, not really. I'm a packet libertarian. You're responsible for all your packets. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, the, that's what you got to say. But you got to log everything. And with containers and serverless, this becomes a really critical thing here. These are just, uh, uh, again, because I teach the 20 crit critical controls class, these are just some of the things highlighted in green that, that Zero Trust Networks help you, uh, help you with uh, in terms of stuff. And yeah, boundary defense. You know, the boundary is, is I've just moved the boundary. All right. Uh, as, you know, and then again, wireless access control and application software security. So one thing I want to leave you with, everything you do in your network affects everybody else whether you know it or not. Back in 2007, we had a little incident 
at, our, at Virginia Tech. You may remember it. It was two buildings over from where I was. And, and um, uh, there is one thing in this room that, is a, that came out of uh, our recommendations after what happened to us in 2007. Take a look around, see if you can identify it. I'll give you 15 seconds to see if you can see what it is. Something around here that, that is a result that this hotel did uh, uh, after what happened to us. Boop, boop. Okay. Anybody? Yeah. Well, shut the doors, you're close. Hmm? Multiple, you're close again. If you look carefully at the doors, well, the exit signs, no, the doors themselves have push bars. What the, what the shooter did was we had the old style push bars that came out with the bar, and he chained them on the inside to keep people from getting in the building. And so one recommendation was that, of that was to prevent that type of incident happening again where they chained from the inside. Because they used to, the ironic thing was that they yelled at us, well, you know, yelled is a relative word, they yelled at us because they said, you, you didn't you know, secure your, your classrooms and the building. Well, he did. <laughs> he prevented the cops from coming in. There was a video showing the, of our tech police who responded within two or three minutes. And they were active shooter trained. But they couldn't get in the building because it had been chained together. So these push bars are an example of that. Okay? So you've been doing ZTN for a number of years now. You just have to have to change your focus. And the focus is this. Forget what comes inbound. It's outbound that counts. Okay? It's not a breach until it leaves the network. Forget the inbound stuff. Monitor your stuff. Those of you that, that have bursars, purchasing, uh, payroll, you know what? About 90% of the traffic from those machines in those offices goes to about 22 or 23 clearinghouse sites. That's it. You see something going to Italy from those machines? Hey, you, did we sign a new agreement with Italy? If the answer is yes, okay, it goes on the good side. If the answer is no, we got a problem, all right? So let me come back here. Remember I said I was going to give you a quiz. So I'm going to come back here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two slides. And I want you to shout out right or left if it was a slide I showed you at the beginning, okay? How may I say left? Okay. It's left. Left or right? I would say right. I may say right, I may say left, okay, it's left. <laughs> I may say left or right, left it is. Okay, with the, may, maybe fuzzy on three or four of them. You saw these pictures for less than a second. Okay, so when you're, when you're going to upper management and you're trying to pitch a zero trust model or things like that, that's what you need to do, okay, is visual. Picture's worth a thousand words in every, every language and every, uh, every culture, okay. With that, thanks a lot, guys.